Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to thank Goldstone for inviting me. Um, what I'm going to talk about, basically, three topics. First, I'm going to say change is possible, to remind you of this. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the factors involved in creating change, with a particular focus on leadership. And thirdly, I'm going to raise the question, what is success anyway? So, change is possible. I'm focusing on change in the professoriate because this is, as you've heard earlier, it's a key position. Often it's the, in fact, the route in most university systems to senior management. Frequently you have to be at professoriate level to sit on boards which allocate resources. So of course it's important also for the individual, but it has key elements of importance for the institution. And I'm giving two examples of where change has happened at full professoriate level over a relatively short period of time. And the argument I'm simply making here is that being told that we'll have to wait 30 or 50 or 100 years, it's just not necessarily so. In the University of Limerick, the proportion of women at full professoriate level went from zero in 1997 to 34% in 2012. It is possible. Unusual, but possible. And for the second example, I chose the Istanbul Technical University, which went from 16% to 32%, also over a 15-year period. Now, these basically, these simple facts challenge the idea that the underrepresentation of women in senior positions is, quote, natural, quote, inevitable. The EU average, by the way, is 21%. So clearly, can do better is the moral there. So, my second best practice trends. In this, I'm drawing on, uh, forgive me, a recent pub well, a publication that's just out on gendered success in higher education, Global Perspectives, edited by Kate White and I. And it embraces 11 countries. And we asked people in each country to identify a university that exemplified best practice in terms of gender at some level. It was, in some cases, for example, the UK, it was the Athena Swan Initiative. In other cases, it was the proportion of women in senior positions. You can see the countries varied very widely. But in the majority, women made up 40% of those at senior management level. And those countries varied from Sweden to South Africa to India to the UAE. In the majority, eight out of the 11, women made up roughly 30% of full professors in basically eight of the 11 countries. Now, in, with this slide, I want to argue that although to improve the overall position of women within the bulk of universities, the legislative framework is key. But best practice universities, the key thing is the internal structure, and particularly leadership within that structure. So, my second theme, what makes the difference? And I want to argue that leadership makes the difference, defining leadership as a process of influence. And of course, we all know leadership can go in different directions. It can go bottom up, top down, or bought in credible experts. And of course, in talking about leadership, I'm talking about a particular organisational and national context. All our situations are different. And timing and synergy and chance all play a part, and we have no control over those. So basically, I'm advocating a multifactorial contextual explanation for change, but one which sees leadership as key. And I thought it might be useful, um, drawing on my own work, uh, work in my own university, to talk about some of the informal, basically, strategies used by gender champions. An Irish case study of this the university where the proportion of women at professoriate level increased dramatically over a 15-year period. So what did the informal gender champions do? Things like using opportunities. There was a Universities Act which actually said you need equal opportunities committees, you need structures. So people who had been problems suddenly became solutions. 
Now, of course, you can't always arrange that the legal framework will change. Perverse alignments. By this, I mean that the alliance between feminists, who are pretty tired of cronyistic, basically, appointments, good golf player, nice guy, needs the appointment, with human, relation, human resource people who were managerialist and concerned with key performance indicators. And so the perverse alignment, in Newman's terms, of these two groups led to greater transparency, identifying clear basis for making decisions. Legitimation. By this I'm talking about, obviously you all know, in universities there are a variety of stakeholders. The research stakeholders are particularly important at this point in time. The most prestigious funding agency in Ireland is the Science Foundation Ireland. By getting research funding from Science Foundation Ireland, that meant that gender was suddenly seen as, quote, respectable, because Science Foundation Ireland had put some money into it. There was also, of course, very useful outcomes in terms of actually that refunding showed that, for example, women were very prominent in housekeeping committees, but pretty well invisible when it came to those dealing with resources, either money or positions. And so, both substantively and symbolically, the legitimation provided by research institu institutions was key. Managing management. One of the skills is making your concerns, framing them in such a way that they are intelligible and make sense to senior management. And so, for example, in the University of Limerick, the, founding, the founder of the university, really, and I wouldn't be taking his character away, he'd be the first to admit it, he had no real interest in gender. But he had started a secular university, which had become a public university, and was very concerned that it would be, continue to be a secular university. So pointing out to him that the, publicly in a governing authority board meeting, that the proportion of women at professoriate level in that university was zero, exactly the same as the proportion in a university devoted to the, to the training of priests, led to an invitation within the week to advise them on what could be done to improve the position of women in this university. That's what I mean by framing issues. Provocative misbehaviour. This is, of course, uh, risky, but actually where the university broke its own guidelines as regards gender representation. And highlighting this led to an invitation uh, and to basically um, to a disciplinary proceedings to meet all the people who had signed off on this all-male board. But um, and so, provocative, obviously, organisations of their very nature, they are pretty intolerant to radical actions. So this is a tricky move. Um, but in this case, it was simply intended as an opportunity to threaten. Mobilising ties across universities. In Ireland, we've had, University of Limerick have had very close ties with, for example, Trinity College Dublin, University College Cork, we, going back to the 90s when we were in women's studies. And those ties have been really useful. So Trinity, for example, led the initiative to extend Athena Swan to Ireland, and we all supported them. So that the taken for granted assumption that colleagues will be backed is a really important and very reassuring thing for each of us when we're fighting our battles individually. Formal leadership. Many of you are in those positions. They are critical in terms of the structures, the culture, the policies, the processes. And some of your work in basically moving agenda, agenda forward can be responding to external challenges which appear to have nothing to do with gender. For example, in Ireland, in the University of Limerick, in Ireland for the first time ever, there was basically a public tender to, for a community-based medical school. It seemed to have nothing to do for, with gender. In fact, it increased the proportion of women in the university by 9%, because at that time, basically women were admitted to medical school, had been there for a number of years, admitted to medical school on the basis of their points in state examination. And the state was anxious to foster relations between medicine and education, so there were chairs available. So a series of, in a way, all the hard work of people who had gone before in terms of that argument, which has since changed, women are no longer admitted to medical school purely on the basis of their results of their um, state exam. But in a way, I suppose the point I'm making here is that 
initiatives which appear to have nothing to do for, with gender can, in fact, make a huge difference. Making unusual appointments. As Minna said, I was, I, came, I, mean, I was course director in women's studies, which is not designed to be a platform for a career in management in Ireland. And yet I moved from that to being the first woman to be appointed at professoriate level, and also the first faculty woman who was a faculty dean. There was another junior woman who was appointed dean of teaching and learning at a junior level. So taking risks backing people, even though, at a, you know, I mean, I looked like trouble, trouble on legs, are you with me? Um, but making those appointments requires courage, and I hope it paid off. Publicly legitimating a gender agenda. In the university, what was striking was that the president would always attend events and effectively acted as a flat jacket for gender. Now, interestingly, um, in the uh, edited book I spoke about, other, country, other best practice organisations, obviously the president or the rector staying for the whole of the conference is an even more important symbolic message, but we never got that far. Specific initiatives, since 2014, Athena Swan, for example, has come to Ireland. Now, both kinds of leadership, both top-down, bottom-up and the external ones that I'm not having a chance to talk about, uh, basically they challenged the idea, the insidious, absolutely pervasive idea that the problem is women. If only we were different. Yes, of course gender works at an individual level, and I'm not going to talk about that at all. But I'm going to take a second to talk about gender works at an interactional level, and also in terms of organisational culture, and at a systemic level, nationally, internationally. Here I'm drawing on my own work at senior management level, top three levels. These, at this level, women made up 20% of those at the, these top levels in Ireland. And these incredibly competent, like yourself, very impressive women, saw their male colleagues' perception of them. Look at it. Disruptive, confrontational, dissenting, frightening, intimidating, out of place. They saw them as too challenging, too questioning, asking uncomfortable questions. Many of you will know these feelings, but to me they have resonances of Cantor's Iron Maiden, which is now 40 years ago. Hello. Lisa's work has shown similar trends in Finland, so it's not just Ireland. Montes Lopez in Spain. Of course, senior management is an area of power. And that is the context where women are out of place. Now, you could say maybe these women were paranoid chips on their shoulders. Well, interestingly, they saw their female colleagues' perception of them as trailblazers, supportive role models. At the organisational level, it's not just Ireland. In, for example, Van den Brink and Benshop in the Netherlands, basically, in two-thirds of the cases, there was not an open competition for professoriate level. In the Netherlands, there is meant to be an open competition, except in exceptional circumstances. Two thirds is not exceptional. Matthias Nielsen has shown similar patterns in Aarhus and Denmark. Helen Peterson has highlighted from Sweden, has highlighted the actual words used in the ads which have gender resonance team player versus strong leadership, for example. Often we all know that even if the ads are publicly advertised, it's a fit up. The actual framing of the ad is so narrow that there's only one person in the entire world, and very surprisingly if a second one appears, that's going to fit the criteria. Differential career opportunities, more chairs in male-dominated areas, think engineering and nursing, workload allocation, which my colleague has spoken about already. Cultures, Lisa will talk about this, just to highlight one or two things. Double standards in American Mastrocus and et al. An experimental study has shown with blind CVs, different names on the top, and basically, both men and women in a research-intensive university favoured the application with the male name and basically wanted him to start at a higher starting salary. Venus and Vold in Sweden basically shocked the country by showing sexism and nepotism in Swedish funding evaluations. Women had to have two and a half times more, basically, research um, articles in order to be assessed as, as scientifically competent as their male colleagues. 
and uh, so concerned has the Swedish funding organisations remained that they have put observers on basically on boards, Alquist et al, looking at what are the processes. And they have noted, for example, more doubt raisers in the case of women candidates. If you're from a good research institution, uh, perhaps it's not her own work. Perhaps she's piggybacking. On the other hand, if you're a man, clearly an excellent candidate. See where he's coming from. This has been called various words. These various concepts used the differential evaluation of men and women. It's been called by Connell a patriarchal dividend, by Bordeaux a negative symbolic coefficient, by Fraser a misrecognition of women. I love the example, which a lot of you are probably very familiar with, of the orchestra, where basically the proportion of the women increased when they were, the auditions were held behind a screen and with their shoes off. If they even heard the tread, it biased the assistant the assessments. The idea of excellence, Matthias Nielsen has written ex done excellent work on excellence and idealised cultural construct, a macro-cultural myth. The tricky thing is evaluations are social processes. Gender is a social construct. How can we evaluate without gender penetrating? Certainly we need to be aware of this. And now the wave at the last indicator, the last theme, what do we mean by success? We have to think what we mean by success so we know what we're fighting for. Yes, of course, gender balance makes absolute sense, both in senior management and at professoriate level. But maybe, as well as we need to think for beyond that, maybe much of the work has been done on actually things that um, deal with or promote gender equality. Maybe we also need to think about the processes and the practices that perpetuate gender inequality. Stereotypes were referred to earlier, for example. We need to think about horizontal segregation, think engineering and nursing. We, think, we need to think, as Roblowski has written a very interesting chapter in the Gender Success in Higher Education, in a, taking a university in Austria, which integrated gender into the values and interests of key stakeholders, into the whole purpose of education. And when you stop and think about it, that makes absolute sense and it sure increases the focus on gender from simply a HR issue that is not salient to the whole focus on what is education about. Structures, cultures, procedures, processes all need to be tackled. Peterson has written some very interesting work saying discipline and space are key elements in bolstering um, patriarchy, misogyny, um, sexism, privileging. We need to tackle these. Othering interactions, the ones I talked about in the context of the senior management study, the perception of women as difficult, disruptive, intimidating if they're in powerful positions. We need, it seems to me, not to put a tooth on it, we need more focus on the development and promotion of feminist leadership as opposed to hegemonic macho leadership. So, what have I been talking about? I'm saying, yes, success is possible. Now, it is true, in the case of the University of Limerick, it was a focus on limited success, but in an intractable area, and within 15 years, it changed. Not other aspects didn't change, and it has begun to reverse, but it certainly challenged the idea that the problem is women. Our lack of confidence, childbearing, child rearing, just us, okay? Best practice trends identified globally, even in unsympathetic and unsupportive national context, still 40% of senior management and 30% of profs were women. Explanation, multifactorial, but leadership, key. So, takeaway phrase, change is possible, but it's neither total nor permanent. Thank you. Thank you.